Welcome to the One Zen Academy Fitness Podcast. Everything health, wellness, fitness and performance all under one roof. My name is Kieran. I've got over 15 years worth of experience within personal training, health, wellness and sports rehabilitation. For more information, go to www.onezenacademy.com. Thank you. Hi guys, hope this finds you well. Today I'm joined by Dr. Sean Maloney, um, who has a doctorate in biomechanics, a strength and conditioning expert. He's a lecturer at both Bedfordshire University and Middlesex University in the UK. Um, one more can be said, he is a, an expert in his field and we discuss uh, all things strength and conditioning, um, age concerns come up, myths, um, to debunk comes up. We look at um, the slight variations in training to do with plyometrics and stiffness. And on that note, when we actually talk about that during the session, because we're on a phone call, um, there's actual disruption on the phone call. So just to clear up what he's actually stating, I asked the question, <clears throat> What's the difference between uh, plyometric training and stiffness? And plyometric training um, refers to the stretch reflex. So the, the muscle tissue and its ability to stretch and then recoil. And that's what plyometric training refers to, that explosive nature. Stiffness um, is tendon specific. So he states that we're trying to limit the amount of crumple or deformation within that tissue um, and can be targeted and trained very specifically, which you'll hear straight after. Um, and it's if you want more information, you can either contact uh, Sean. Um, these details are at the end of the podcast, or you can kind of look it up and research it because these are terms that you may or may not have uh, come across before. You may just be familiar with plyometric training, increased explosiveness, but now we have the term stiffness training, uh, which can enhance um, performance in certain areas, but the question he poses is why are you doing this you know what is your end goal so hope that makes sense it will make sense once you hear it in context um but it's just be clear that yeah the the phone call was a bit distorted at that point but the rest of it is awesome I just want to also give you a heads up that um, we do offer on the onesandacademy.com website, we do offer the personal training diploma, the sports therapy diploma. So if you're starting to like what you hear and you think, you know what, I can definitely do something like this or I want to help people, then we are your best bet. We include all tuition, books, we include everything you can imagine. We also do a, a kind of a distance learning way of doing it as well. Um, but yeah, feel free to uh, message me on uh, via the website, onesandacademy.com. And we also do online training. So if you look into increase health and you look at health as I do as a performance or you want to increase aspects of performance, injury rehab and so on, or nutrition, then we offer a fantastic monthly subscription to our online training package. Check it out. Without further ado, I give you Dr. Sean Maloney. So, um, yeah, welcome. <clears throat> welcome, Sean. How are you doing? Good, thank you, Kieran. How are you, buddy? Yeah, always good, always. Um, <clears throat> so just, I guess, a bit of context for anyone who's listening. Uh, can you give us a bit uh, of background about yourself, your hero's journey, I guess, the road you're on and, and why you're on it, really? Cool. Uh, well, my name's Sean Maloney for um, well, pretty much all of the audience who won't know who I am. Uh, I'm a strength and conditioning coach based in Milton Keynes primarily. Um, so I've got my own company, do a lot of consulting work. So I work for people like Babbage in England, Wasps, Football Association, things like that. Um, also work as a lecturer around strength and conditioning, sports science, all things kind of nerdy and geeky relating to uh, getting stronger, running mm -hmm. faster, jumping higher. So I work at universities of Bedfordshire and Middlesex. And 
Edinburgh. I also head up their champagne conditioning department too. Nice. So what what possessed you to kind of go down the strength, uh, strength I guess, uh, road? Especially because, I mean, you've got, um, you know, a, a doctorate in biomechanics. Kind of what's led you down that massive road? I guess everything, like a um, very common story within strength and conditioning is failed athlete, not quite good enough for anything. <laughs> um, and growing up, food, playing football, rugby, everything like that, um, I kind of had to make the training side of things more of a focus to make up for my lack of skill, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's all the benefits that I had to me as a football and rugby player and then taking that on to working with some of the athletes I play rugby with at university, making them stronger, faster, injury resilient. Mm. Um, then found a real love for that and generally just trying to uh, get the best out of people really like I tried to do for myself yeah okay so in, in all your kind of um, just on, on from that in, in all your kind of studies in all your research um, how, how has that um, either changed or enhanced your training or the training of others I appreciate that might be a maybe a big question it's a huge question yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess the, the key thing is being able to kind of surf both sides of that curve really and understand mm. kind of the limitations of academic work as well as the limitations of what you can do in the field where you're working with athletes and general population and hopefully what you have is your work in practice giving you the questions that you can then go away and study in a more kind of controlled research mm. scenario so um, yeah basically I had burning questions that I wanted to try and work towards getting better answers to there's yeah. never a kind of definitive answer in certain conditioning research as I'm sure you'll appreciate mm -hmm. but yeah just trying to understand more about how the body works and how we can maximise um, our return on investment really in training so yeah. we want to get the biggest bang for buck and we want to make sure that athletes are able to do their sport training um, yeah. because that's the big focus that any athlete's going to have mm. and um, yeah be as kind of minimal dose but maximal response as we can with what we do outside of their um, outside of their sport specific yeah. work okay well what would you say the biggest areas in uh, strength and conditioning are at the, at the moment are there any kind of trends or anything that's changed drastically for you that um, either sports teams or athletes or general public want to see more of um, I think it's definitely progressing in the right direction and we're seeing a mm. lot more um, working with youth athletes now right nice. down to the kind of under X under 9 starting to get them involved in what good strength and conditioning should look like more of an appreciation there yeah. um, getting over some of the myths like strength training stunting growth and right. potentially dangerous things like that Yeah. Um, and seeing more of a trend towards strength training and power based training becoming as um, a little more popular for general population as well mm. um, I guess CrossFit's got we've got so much to thank for that bringing that into the general population people understanding the benefits benefits of yeah. strength training throughout the life and now we're seeing people well into their 60s, 70s and 80s still being able to compete at high levels in the likes mm. of powerlifting, weightlifting and sprinting with the kind of master's categories there. Nice, nice. Um, that brings me on to a couple of other points actually and you kind of it hit the nail on on the head. Um, so, are there, are there any myths out there that you've um, heard of with regards to strength training and lifting weights that just completely, one hundred percent, are not true? Well, hopefully, we're doing a better job at quashing some of them. But um, yeah. I guess, as I say, one of the ones that's remained for a long time is mm. the strength training stunting growth with yeah. athletes. Um, again, no evidence to support that, um, mm. and overwhelmingly, the evidence is showing that if athletes strength train appropriately under supervised coaches yeah. then they get less injuries than the guys and girls that don't yeah. um, so all in all it's going to develop their um, kind of physical abilities as well as their mental abilities too in the long run mm. uh, I guess another one is um, strength training making you kind of slow and muscle bound right. I think there the problem comes from equating what bodybuilders do or what yeah. elite level powerlifters do with everyone else so Bodybuilding is all about aesthetics. Mm. They're not interested in the performance side of things. Um, not wanting to cast aspersions over the whole bodybuilding <laughs> crowd, um, if there's any of them listening. Um, 
And same for powerlifters, they have a very specific goal. It's all about lifting the most weight possible. It's not so much of a factor how quickly they're lifting it. Um, yeah. Obviously, I think they have the potential to maybe benefit more from doing ballistic and power type of work. Mm. Um, maybe powerlifting being a bit of a misnomer there because they don't need power. They yeah. just need the strength. Um, but done well. Um, strength training in combination with sprint training, biometrics, other forms of ballistic training isn't going to make you slow, it's going to make you faster. It's improving your ability to produce force, then we can work on using that force more quickly. Okay, nice. Anything else you've heard out there that, or it kind of, like, cause I don't know about you, but I, I sometimes go to different gyms and you're in the changing rooms and I'll hear something and it may make you kind of internally laugh inside, but you think, wow, that, that information is still out there and I can't believe they're even entertaining it. Oh yeah, some of the things you do uh, <laughs> you hear are, are priceless. Um, I guess there's things that have I guess, some sort of basis to them, like squats being bad for your back or your mm. knees. And okay. if they are, you're doing them badly. And if you're not thinking about how you're loading throughout the week, throughout mm. the year, um, yeah. and you're just not allowing the body to recover. But again, full range squats done well. They're going to do more for your flexibility and more for your overall general health and well-being that's yeah. positive than, than is negative um, yeah. and then I guess the last thing would be the idea that strength training makes you inflexible mm. it's only if you're training through shortened ranges that yes. it's going to make you flexible if you're training through full ranges of motion um, strength training is going to probably have more of a benefit than just static stretching for yeah. example because you're teaching the body and the brain to be able to control through full ranges mm. of motion so for example if you're doing something like a weighted car phrase or you know, an unweighted single leg just dropping up and down off a step that's probably going to improve your calf flexibility more than just holding a static stretch for yeah. two minutes a few times a week yeah nice one yeah I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that actually because um, I guess in in, in in my world in rehabilitation and, and so on um, I think it's really important for people to under understand that it's almost like you're you're telling your nervous system that it's okay to go somewhere and come back rather than hold on to like a, a maybe like a protective range of motion. Um, would that make sense? Absolutely. You can't see me here, but I'm nodding here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your brain is like a really overprotective mother. It won't let you go anywhere. Mm. It doesn't think you should go. Uh, yeah. If you're teaching it that you can cross the road without having your hand held, mm. then the brain will let you go into those ranges of motion. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, 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 it's weird, really, because I've had conversations in the gym recently. Um, so I've been back on, uh, you know, snatches and cleans and the rest of it. And, you know, I've always, you know, pride myself that I can get into a really kind of deep squat position relatively easy. And um, the conversation come up, well, you must do a lot of um, flexibility work. And... And my point only is sort of yes and no. I mean, I teach yoga, but that's not the reason why I can do that. And trying to explain that actually it was the the strength training and how your nervous system integrates with the, the bigger picture. Um, but it was one of those things where the, the, the concept of, no, you have to work on flexibility was still in this person's head. And um, I think it was tough for them to, to get around. I think there was a degree of cognitive dissonance, put it that way. Um, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And it's like anything, you will be resistant to concepts that are completely new. But yeah, um, yeah hopefully if we're aware of some of these biases, um, like yeah. a great book recommendation for anyone who's not had it is Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Just oh, yeah. Yes. some of the biases we have as, yeah, um, brilliant as humans book. and um, yeah counteracting some of those by just being aware of them yeah fantastic but I, I agree it's a, <clears throat> there's some awesome books out there that that book on um, audio book is surprisingly good as well yeah just just because I do a lot of driving I have a lot of audio books uh, but yeah really good love it nice um so what just because my, my mind is racing i'm thinking while i've got you to kind of bombard you with questions um what, what's the, the 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 youngest 
age group you could probably do like um strength work with to see some real gains i guess and when i say gains i'm talking about injury prevention and performance enhancement um well, i guess as soon as they are doing something that is performance related you can yeah. start to see performance improvements mm. and i guess the big thing is um making sure that more mentally they're mm. ready for whatever you're going to do okay. so the younger the level um there's going to be much less structure mm. and they're simply going to get better because they're maturing physically as well as yeah. mentally they could just do absolutely nothing sit on the couch and they're still probably going to get stronger <laughs> and quicker just by the fact <laughs> <laughs> their body maturing yeah. Um, but yeah I've worked with um, anything from the ages of kind of 5 to 6 up okay. to um, 67 68 some of our masters lifters um, the nice. great thing about working with younger kids is they pick things up so quickly they yeah. just don't overthink things and complicate things they yeah. can just look at things repeat it if it doesn't work you maybe tweak what mm. you're trying to do slightly and then they pick it up nice um, yeah. yeah and it, they're not having to unlearn all the bad habits that we get into <laughs> in this kind of western world of Indeed. being seated and on iPhones and iPads and everything like that yeah no, nothing like a good bit of uh, forward head posture and all that to uh, disrupt some good lifting eh? um, yeah I guess <laughs> that's all the stuff you just come into every single day with, yeah. with the guys and girls that you work with yeah it's uh, it's 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 only getting worse really um, you know with all the kind of screen time and and, and so on that you kind of the, the young kids are expected to do I mean my uh, four and a half year old I mean I wish, I wish I had the opportunities when I was his age I mean he does ballet skiing gymnastics um, he was doing rugby you know all sorts he's four and a half and, um, and yeah I've noticed just by doing those the massive improvements in strength uh, is, is phenomenal absolutely phenomenal um, and yeah doesn't overthink it just gets on with it easy going yeah, you, yeah. you just don't have that fear factor that age, mm. do you? so if you can do things like gymnastics martial mm. arts dance all those things where you're kind of having to connect with the movement more mm. and things where you're like just simple things like being out of shoes and just thinking about how the body moves and how you're interacting with the world around you it's just yeah. find that when I get athletes at 18, 19, 20 it's the ones that have done the gymnastics the dance mm. the martial arts that just pick things up so much quicker down that yeah. path yeah um I mean, on to that with the the older the older athletes that you see. I mean, maybe it's just me. I've seen a marked increase in the the older generation, like the sixties, seventies, taking up things like weightlifting and powerlifting. I know you mentioned it before, but I mean, in your experience, have you seen a marked increase in this? Yeah, definitely. And we've got a few of our masters lifters um, mm. that train our weightlifting and powerlifting club, and we've even got one Sarah who won a medal at the IPF World Powerlifting Championships wow, awesome. uh, last year bronze medal in the squat um, I mean she's been active all her life she's a phenomenal yeah. athlete but started powerlifting it into her 60s so um, mm. yeah and just going to powerlifting and weightlifting competitions the masters events are becoming so popular now <laughs> so just full of athletes throughout the, wow. throughout the masters classes it's really good to see. Yeah, yeah, it is fantastic to see. I mean, how how, how do you think the um, the I guess the weight training, the powerlifting, the strength training, however you want to I guess term it, how do you think that has benefited um, people as as they get older? <laughs> Well, I guess the big thing is maintaining muscle mass and mm. just maintaining that level of performance within the muscle. So holding on to some of those muscle fibers that are more likely to uh, kind of decline with age yeah. with disuse. Um, particularly if you're now retired, not working, not as active. Mm. Um, counteracting some of that with getting in the gym, um, particularly trying to get people into doing more explosive power work to hold on to those type 2 muscle fibers. Yeah. And it's that power, that explosiveness that tends to be the first thing to go. Yeah. That's going to be the thing that prevents against you, or maybe not prevents, but if you do fall or slip, you can then catch yourself. It's those type 2 explosive mm. muscle fibers that you need to um, 
look after yourself and stay safe really getting into uh, older age um, and then the other thing is preventing against um, or at least slowing down mm. bone mineral density loss um, more so for the female athletes as well yeah after, um, after they hit menopause yeah it's a, it's, it's a big thing at the uh, at the moment I mean I, I do a lot of um, type 2 diabetes prevention workshops and we, we often see kind of uh, I guess a, a trend so they people don't do any strength training and the thought of it scares the bejesus out of them um, and things like um, a lack of vitamin D obviously calcium with that and seeing elevated cholesterol levels and, and so on um, but what we do like this little um, uh, workshop where it's just basic strength work and when I say strength work we're talking about body weight stuff supported squats and so on but the feedback we get maybe a month or two afterwards is I don't know what it's done for type 2 diabetes but I move a lot better and I feel I can move better uh, and that's just generally the feedback we get and I, I find it phenomenal because I haven't had anyone yet um, state it's been bad <laughs> so it's I think that, that for me I guess there needs to be more kind of pushed out there for the for the older athletes to make it more accessible um, but I'm glad you guys are, are, are taking on uh, people and training them up was that Milton Keynes um Milton Keynes Power Sports yeah nice and just for the sake of people listening Milton Keynes uh, Power Sports is where in Milton Keynes uh, so we train within the National Babington Centre so Latin Lodge um, nice. and we're um, yeah weightlifting club powerlifting club and kind of general strength and, and conditioning work as well for some kind of multi sport athletes nice and um, when, when does that when does that run so we run open gyms on Monday Wednesday Friday and Saturdays at the weekend as well nice so we have four club sessions uh, over the week nice what we'll do at the end as well um before we end if you give kind of the, the detail your like your contact details maybe for that or your website and so on and we can kind of get people kind of looking into that especially if they're in the, the local region oh, awesome thank you um, so the, I, this is a question I've got and I guess it's a, a more of a a personal question just purely because I'm generally interested um uh, stiffness versus plyometric training what is the difference um, so probably being a little bit pedantic <laughs> but, um, we talk about plyometric training um, so it means to increase something so it's the idea that if you stretch something you get more back from the other side if it's about an elastic band then when you pull it back when you stretch more capacity well you'll get the elastic band coming through and that's what we're trying to get into with our tendons and basically our Achilles tendon in the back of our car so if we're doing something plyometric let's say we do a uh, drop jump off a box the idea of getting more plyometric is that you'll jump higher if you jump off the box jump versus if you just jump standing and getting down um, so that's plyometric that's all about kind of augmenting the trick side of things and that we call it that this is more about how much you can resist those forces when you hit the ground so minimising crumple so to speak so there's two ways you can perform it drop jump you can either Really sure, and let me just, uh, sorry, fella, let me just stop you there. You keep breaking up. Um, hold on. Stiffness on the other hand is just about how much you can resist or resist crumpling to hit the ground. Mm -hmm. But if we want to maximise stiffness in a vertical jump, we might have to sacrifice the bed pipe just like that. So it's about being as quick off the floor as we can. But take that drop jump example. This time we stop the box. I think we hit the ground back, but the drop jump up now is only 35 to 45 centimeters. So we've got less with the center brick. We've made targeted tendon more because we're focusing on that tendon working. We have the basketball involved less, which is focusing on that tendon store. 
you kind of have two different goals. If you're just focusing on the pure output side of things, mm. then plyometrics with longer ground contact times and slightly longer stretch shortening cycles are the way to go. If you're playing in sports where you need to be super explosive off the ground and those contacts are super short, mm. so thinking about like when you're up to top speed in a 100 meter race, you're in contact with the ground for less than 0.1 of a second. Yeah. Not so much about the max output, it's about how stiff you can be and how much you can resist deforming when you hit mm. the ground. But that's when stiffness training becomes a little more uh, important. Okay. Okay, so so would you say um, um, a guest for a sprinter, for instance, would you do a mixture of working on plyometric and stiffness in combination, or how, how would that look? Yeah, we'd do a mix of both. Mm. And um, stiffness training is inherently plyometric, but mm. maybe the goal of what you do needs to be a little more completely defined. Yeah. So you can do the same plyometric drill that mm. focuses more on stiffness or more more on the output at the end. And the easiest way to think about it is, are you focusing more on the muscles and the nervous system, or are you focusing more on the tendon working? Okay. Nice. Yeah, so... Um, so yeah, I guess it comes down to who should do what, but I think you've kind of summed it up. So I mentioned sprinters. Uh, I'm assuming most, in your view, would most athletes kind of benefit from a, um, a mixture of both, depending on what their obviously their 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 goal is. Yeah, definitely. They're going to benefit from a mixture of both. And it's thinking about, um, yeah, the actions that they're performing in their sport. So mm. if, it's, uh, if it's somebody playing football, you know you're going to need to change direction and jump a lot. Um, it's more the plyometric side of things that is going to benefit them more. Yeah. Whereas if you're um, in a sport like triple jump or long jump, then it's going to be the stiffness side of things that's a little more important. Mm. Obviously, both are going to have both to some degree, but it's... Um, yeah, thinking about the sporting demands and what they're going to need to uh, to perform. Okay, nice. Um, would would you see? Uh, obviously, if if training is periodized, you know, and it's progressing nicely, um, I'm assuming you would see fairly, you know, low to moderate injury rates. But if someone kind of, for instance, uh, jumped up one day and thought, you know what, I'm going to try <laughs> some stiffness training out now, maybe they've had, you know, coming back from a layoff. Uh, I'm assuming you wouldn't necessarily advise it or maybe some sort of interim low-level type stuff. What would, you, what would you say? Yeah, and as much as anything, just thinking about how you're progressing the volume. So um, mm. the closer you get into the true kind of stiffness-focused training, yeah. um, the more loading you're going to have on the tendon. Mm. Uh, tendon's quite slow in terms of remodeling versus yeah. muscles, so you need to be a little more uh, kind of aware of how you're increasing the load and making sure there's no kind of massive spikes mm. so if you go from doing none to lots there's a massive spike <laughs> if you go from doing none to a little bit to some to a little bit more and then into more hopefully you've got a little more progression and you've allowed that tendon to be modeled in response to the kind of loads that you're putting through okay okay nice yeah, I like that. Um, with, with regards to things like uh, injury prevention, what, what would you say? It, would you say strength training is one of the biggest elements of injury prevention? And when I say injury prevention, I'm I'm talking very generically. Yeah, and obviously we can never prevent injuries, but we can do our best to kind of mitigate um, their occurrence. Really, mm. um, yeah, I'd say strength is your kind of cornerstone, really, and strength tied very closely to mobility because mm. you need strength throughout full ranges of motion yeah. um, and that sets the basis for kind of everything we do really um, injury occurs when the tissue or whatever structure it is can't cope with the load that's being imposed upon it mm. so if the body can tolerate higher loads because it's stronger it's going to be more resilient to injury okay nice um <coughs> What would you say is a good um, starting point for, I guess, 
distance runners and when I say distance runners it could be your, your general kind of people on a Saturday morning doing the park run or they're thinking about going to 10k half marathon marathon what would you say is a good start point in terms of strength training with regards to uh, distance runners um, obviously first thing would be go to try and find somebody that you trust that mm. is um, an appropriate coach that yeah. can coach you through the right techniques for the basic gym exercises that we give to anyone in any sport mm. um, but as more general considerations for runners probably starting at the ankle yeah. where the rubber meets the road making sure you have appropriate strength and mobility through the ankle complex mm. so starting with things as simple as heel raises um, progressing from flat to offset um, then that can progress into some of our lower level plyometric movements so things like pogo hops ankling drills things like that so making sure we have the mobility then building strength through those full ranges then building um, kind of appropriate stiffness um, and stiffness doesn't mean lack of mobility yeah something that people can often get confused it's we want lack of mobility but because we choose to have it not as a imposed demand because we're inflexible so we yeah. need mobility and we need strength then building the stiffness on top of that um, so that would probably be the easiest and most beneficial entry level kind of progression for a distance runner really ankle sh mobility ankle strength and then ankle stiffness with things like pogo hops and ankle mm. drills Okay, it's it's um it's funny because I I wholeheartedly agree. It's I, I guess from what I see, I, I guess I've got a lot of experience, especially with runners. Um, a lot of runners uh, tend to go straight for the most expensive trainers, um, in the hope that the trainers will prevent the injury or somehow increased performance. Um, do you see similar things within maybe strength training or powerlifting where, I, I, I don't know what a word is, people kind of, they look to maybe external things to help them first, if that makes sense? Do you... uh, yeah, I guess that is always a danger. So mm. people go into things like weightlifting belts mm. or knee sleeves and things like that before you've maybe almost earned the right to be using some of those things. Yes, um, yeah. I mean, they all have their place, and if they yeah. use well, it's great. But, yeah. yeah, it shouldn't be a crutch that you then rely on and mm. need to train. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, with coming back to the, the the runners, you know, first and foremost, you know, running is a a skill, and sometimes people don't really want to, I guess, learn the skill of running. Um, but I mean, I've worked with runners just working on, I guess, the emphasis on the the skill of running and um, the the mobility, the strength work of the the foot, the ankle, and then up through the the calf and how the hip interacts with the knee, knee, foot, and so on. And people are quite surprised the fact that they're able to improve running performance and, and, and minimize injury that they may have had before. Um, and it just, I think, goes to show there's, there's still maybe a, a long road to go with regards to, you know, some decent strength training for the, I guess, the masses. Um, it, it just, yeah. just from what I see. Yeah, and it does seem to be getting there. And, mm. and you've got guys like um, you know, Rich Blagrove, who's lecturer, yeah. who's just um, switched to Lufper, actually. He's got a great book out on the strength and conditioning for distance runners, which nice. if you've got any distance runners watching, might be a great one to, to delve into. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, awesome. Um, I guess uh, on the in in the wider in the wider scope, um, <clears throat> where where do you think kind of uh, strength? I guess strength training is is going generally. Is it is it doing enough? Do you think is it you know what, what could what more could be done? I guess. I guess it depends where you look. Really, mm. um, it's there does seem to be with the 
um, with the rise of CrossFit, it does seem to be just spreading into places like yeah. David Lloyd's Collegiate Actives, um, where you see much more of an emphasis on the functional side of things. So you've now yeah. got TRXs, tracks, mm. space where you can move, sleds, things like that. So there has been a nice push more towards the um, the functional side, as much as I might hate that word. Um, <laughs> And coming away from just doing cardio machines and mm. machine-based weights, um, which is nice to see. Um, I think still in terms of coaching people in yeah. those sorts of environments, that leaves a little to be desired. It's very much um, people are almost given free reign and there's not enough guidance in mm. some of those establishments. So maybe moving towards... Um, more group trains, group training, so be private training to yeah. kind of just give people the skills so they can then go and fend for themselves, so to speak, when it comes to that kind of training. Yeah. Okay. And what, I mean, what are your thoughts on uh, cross training? I mean, you mentioned it a couple of times. Um, I think people tend to have mixed views on it. I mean, is it a good thing, bad thing? What were your thoughts? It's been great for business. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, for, there's lots that, are, that is fantastic about it, and mm. probably the biggest thing is the cultural side of things. Yeah. Um, the communities that they build are mm. really strong, and they're close knit communities that do almost everything together. Yeah. Um, there's obviously some issues if it's not done well. You've mm. got things like Olympic lifts and gymnastics and 1RMs that have a lot of potential to go wrong. So yeah. if they're not coached in the right way and mm. if they're if you have people doing them that don't have the right to do them yet or are doing those things under fatigue, potentially yeah. there's an issue. Um, but again, it's like anything, that comes down to the specific box that they're training in and the specific coaches that they're training with. Mm. Um, everything needs to be appropriate for the individual at that time um, and in the condition they're in. So if they're fatigued because they've just done 400 metre repeat sprints, it's probably not a good time to be doing a one-arm snatch where you can mm. drop the bar on your neck and um, yeah. paralyze yourself. Mm, yeah, it's a bit inconvenient that. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so cross training, you know, has its, I guess, pluses and minuses. I guess just like, just like anything. To be fair, um, I mean, with, with regards to um, final question, uh, just regards to the, the the nervous system as a whole. Um, what would you say is because we mentioned with regards to uh, children they don't overthink things uh, do you do any kind of with your guys for instance do you do any kind of uh, breath work do you do any kind of mindset in you know and again it, it may pain some people to hear the word but you know a more holistic I guess uh, more uh, rounded approach do you do any of that sort of stuff with them uh, I guess kind of not directly mm. and, and so they don't think of it in that direct mm. um, context really but breath work something we do a huge amount of um, more in terms of the kind of biomechanical and physiological changes that we yeah. can get about through appropriate breathing yeah. so um, particularly with the younger athletes um, just getting them to do something like a slow relaxation belly star breath at the yeah. end of a session um, and teaching them to breathe as we want them to breathe as well mm. um, it's amazing how many people you ask them to take a breath in and you'll just <laughs> see their shoulders go up towards yeah. their ears and so trying to get people out of those habits um, and if you do that kind of slow relaxation breathing for a couple of minutes with your eyes closed you should be feeling tired afterwards and we're trying to take that body at the end of the session from a sympathetic state into a parasympathetic state and just kickstart that recovery process mm. and conversely with some of our weightlifters our powerlifters we might do the opposite we might go into a shallow chest breathing mm -hmm. style strategy to try and bring on that sympathetic nervous system so that yeah. we can gear them up for that 1RM attempt mm. or, or that last lift that they need to make um, yeah 
and okay. then lots of work with breath around mobility and positioning pelvis and things like that. Yeah. So it's a little more complex. Yeah, nice. Yeah, breath work for me is kind of my, I guess, my biggest area at the moment. Have you tried um, uh, Wim Hof breathing? Uh, yeah, we've actually got one of our students, uh, Middlesex, is here who's uh, looking into some of that stuff. Which okay, is really nice. Interesting. But, um, I've, yeah, I've noticed really massive, the, um, massive increases, massive increases doing um, Wim Hof breathing before any lifts. And, and I couldn't tell you if it's a placebo effect or, you know, it's very much for me uh, N equals one scenario. But I do see a marked increase in output with regards to whether it's lifting, whether it's running, any anything like that. Um, and then afterwards, it's more the relaxation, I guess, breath work. But I have found, yeah, the, the Wim Hof breathing has been a, um, a, it's now a staple of the, the, nice. the warm up process, so to speak. Um, and obviously, because I'm in a, a, in a gym, people tend to look at you quite, <laughs> quite bizarrely. Because <laughs> in essence, you're hyperventilating, you know, lying down hyperventilating and people often come up, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm not having a heart attack, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool, but thanks for coming. <laughs> um, final, final thought. Um, and this really is final thought. Um, do you have any kind of tips or any strategies that you use to enhance recovery, uh, nutrition, uh, nutrition aside? <laughs> Uh, big thing is trying to get people to prioritise sleep, I guess. Mm. So, um, and it's becoming more of a in vogue topic, I guess, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing kind of like on the shelf of your water service and things like that, books on sleep, like yeah. the New England Wales one and things like that. So people are becoming more aware of it. And um, things like the night mode on the iPhone, you can see it's starting to slip into the yeah. public consciousness a little more. So um, it's always going to be hard, particularly when you're working with um, 16, 17, 18 year olds, yeah. um, trying to get them to prioritize that over other things. <laughs> Indeed. But that's probably the big one we're trying to encourage. Okay. Anything else you've looked at um, or you've kind of read about recently? Um, on the recovery side, um, I try not to think too far outside the main box, really, until yeah. our athletes have that box in place. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's kind of sleep, hydration, mm. getting outside as much as you can, natural light, particularly yeah. when um, the weather's a little bit nicer than it is today on a very <laughs> rainy uh, afternoon. Indeed. So, yeah, okay, so basically well, so get the basics like right first and before you move on to anything else. Is that is that the general message? Completely. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of um, things out there at the moment, like the, the key words are things like biohacking. Um, and, yeah, people are kind of looking for that, that, that magic bullet again. Um, but not willing to actually lay the foundation for anything. And yeah, you're right. You know, just getting outside, you know, getting some natural sunlight, going to sleep at regular times. And people are just like, nah, nah, there, there must be, some, there must be something else. Um, cause it, it's almost like too simple, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's simple, but, um, it's not always easy. No, it's not, but you know, it is incredibly effective, but, um, but yeah, that, I mean, that, that's pretty much uh, it from me. Is there anything else you want to uh, add or anything you've read recently that is of interest? Uh, it might be of interest to me. I'm not sure it will be to anyone else, but uh, no, I think that's covered everything here. It's been awesome <laughs> to chat with you, mate. Awesome. Um, uh, a quick shameless plug of your website or where people can find you. Uh, yeah. Uh, maloneyperformance.com um, and then Maloney Performance on all your kind of social medias um, nice on Instagram as well we also have a page for the non Keens Power Sports um, so yeah can catch up with some of our lifters doing um, doing good things and um, random events we might be at so um, like we just got back from the British Weightlifting Championships in Coventry nice so I uh, got to see loads of cool people like uh, Bodana Toma Hilia Illian and uh, yes yeah, some uh, nice battles between the likes of Zoe Smith Sarah Davis awesome 
Yeah, love it. Love it. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, your time today. Really appreciate it, fella. Pleasure, mate. Thank you for the invite. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the One Zen Fitness Academy podcast. My name's been Kieran. Please, please share with your friends. Leave us a five-star review and subscribe. Thank you for your time. Thank you.